The Deadly Assassin is a unique story in many ways. Uh, it's the only story in the classic series in which the Doctor is without a companion, and the first one that's set entirely on Gallifrey, introducing a ton of lore that would go on to be used in many other TV stories, as well as books and audios. Uh, there's always a problem in setting stories on Gallifrey, uh, in that it's the Doctor's home, uh, so it has to be dull enough that he doesn't want to stay there, but exciting enough to tell a decent story, and this is one of the few times they managed to pull that off. Uh, the first episode opens a bit like the movie Star Wars, with a scroll iteration to set the scene. Uh, it must be a coincidence though, as Star Wars didn't come out for another few months, but it's interesting all the same. Uh, there's a dreamlike feel to the first episode, uh, as the Doctor is beset with psychic visions of him killing the Time Lord President, and he spends the rest of the episode sneaking around until he's in a position to do that exact thing, barely interacting with any of the characters as he does so. Um, it is interesting to see Tom Baker having to act by himself, uh, though he does have to talk to Thin Air quite a bit, uh, which is certainly in character, uh, but not really sustainable. Uh, perhaps they should have given him a surrogate companion for a few stories, uh, like David Tennant has for the Christmas specials, and then they could have brought back the most popular one on a permanent basis later on, uh, but that may have been too complicated for the time. In episode 2, the Doctor finally gets to interact with the rest of the cast, as he is captured and put on trial, while the viewer is invited to guess which of the Time Lords is a black-robed figure working with the Master. Um, but it's not hard to rule out most of the candidates, uh, the Castellan has a very strong accent, which will be instantly recognisable. Engin sounds too old, and Perusa sounds too theatrical. So it can only really be Goth, who is also the one character rooting for the Doctor to be executed, as well as the only other candidate for the presidency. So it's really not that sophisticated a murder mystery. Most of the second half of the story is set in the Matrix, uh, which may well have inspired the one in the movies. For all I know, one of the Wachowskis could well have seen this story when they were young. Uh, there are some incredible location sequences here, a real contrast to all the stuffiness on Gallifrey. There is some attempt at surreal imagery, with the Doctor scraping away a layer of sand to reveal a mirror within which is a laughing clown. But for the most part, episode 3 is a pretty brutal extended sequence of two men stalking each other and trying to kill each other. Mary Whitehouse may have had a point about it being too strong for kids, but it's still an incredible piece of television that's still as gripping as ever. This story only falls down in episode 4, uh, where we have the final confrontation between the Doctor and the Master. Um, I do like that the threat seems to be vanquished early on, and everybody relaxes and goes about their business for a while. Uh, but then it throws a ton of new information at the viewer, about the seal of Rassilon and the Eye of Harmony, um, and then it's not particularly clear what's happening in the fight between the Doctor and the Master, uh, which makes for a slightly unsatisfying ending. Uh, the look of Gallifrey is particularly striking, uh, with sets that look like they're made of giant green crystals, and of course the iconic Time Lord robes which have been used many times since. Um, it has to be one of the most elaborate and memorable costume designs in the show's history, um, if rather impractical, but the fact that they're still used for the Gallifrey stories to this day is a testament to their longevity. Uh, the guest cast has some familiar faces. Uh, Bernard Horsfall is playing Chancellor Goth in his fourth and final appearance. Um, his performances are always memorable due to his distinctive voice, uh, but this is the first time he's played a villain and he clearly relishes the opportunity, throwing himself into all the physical combat scenes in the Matrix, and hissing with impotent fury in his deathbed confession at the end. George Prafter is also strong as Castellan Sprandrell. Um, at the start, it seems like he's going to be the cop who tries to put the Doctor away, but he turns out to be a good ally, and is supportive of the Doctor throughout. And Eric Chitty gives a delightful performance as wizened old coordinator Engin. He was only 70 when he played the role, but he looks at least 100. Peter Pratt as the master is the weak link of the show. Anyone would have had a hard time trying to match Roger Delgado's performance, uh, but Pratt is saddled with googly eyes and a mask which makes it hard to understand anything he says, uh, which makes the character a big failure. Uh, there are about an hour of DVD extras. Uh, there's a half hour Talking Heads documentary, in which Tom Baker reveals his desire to wear a frock. There's a ten minute feature on the politics of the show, and it's links to the Manchurian Candidate which seems a bit thin, as the Doctor isn't actually being mind-controlled to kill anyone, it just seems like he is, uh, but I guess that's close enough, and a 16-minute feature talking about fear and the scariest moments of the show, including the new series. Overall, it's an absolute classic, only let down by some of the master scenes, uh, but even so, I'll definitely give it a 9. Next week, Leela shows up in the face of evil. I've only seen that once before, so that should be interesting. Um, as ever, check out the playlist in the description below uh, for my reviews of every Doctor Who story so far. And I'll see you next time.